Well, the title of today's message is The Witness of Pentecost. The Witness of Pentecost. And as you know, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to break down a little bit, going to get into what that means and why that's relevant to us today. But we're going to start here in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read the first four verses on the day of Pentecost, the experience of the early church, the birth of the church, like we saw in the video, and then we'll dig in. So the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for the exciting times that we live in. Lord, that you did not leave us orphans, but that you sent us your spirit so that we could walk in power and victory in this life and on into the next. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us powerfully. Lord, that you reveal to us something that we need. Lord, you would give to us and impart to us what we need today so that when we leave this place, we leave empowered by God to go do the things that you called us and created us to do. Lord, we honor you and bless you in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. So I wanna ask you a question. What, what do you think of when you think of the word Pentecost? Now, now I, I, I bet you most of y'all are not thinking 50. Was anybody thinking 50 when I said Pentecost? Did you know that that's what Pentecost literally means in the Greek? Penta is five, cost is times 10, Pentecost 50. That's literally what Pentecost means. But I would guess most of y'all thought Pentecostal, didn't you? Yeah, you're thinking Pentecostal. You know, when I got saved, I actually got saved in a Pentecostal church. I, uh, we were newly married and I didn't know nothing about the church. I didn't really grow up in church. I was a massive heathen. I was a good heathen. I was, you know, if, if good can be a thing for being bad, but I was bad at, I was good at being bad. And uh, I, I, we got, shortly after we got married, I remember waking up one day and saying to her, we got to find a church. And since she knew better than me, uh, she was like, all right, let's look for a church. And she found us a church that was close to the house and it happened to be a Pentecostal church. Now she was definitely more godly than me. And as you can tell, she's, you know, why did she pressure wash? I didn't make her pressure wash y'all. So don't be mad. And I'm like, why is, why is Pastor Mason making Pastor Annette pressure wash? I did not send her out there. She decided she wanted to pressure wash on her own, but she did that. I'm supposing so that God could speak to her about power. Amen. <laughs> but she's a godly woman. So she, she brought us, you know, she found this church and we went to this church and, and, uh, I'm telling you, I don't know what the pastor preached. I just know that when I was there, the whole experience was totally new to me. But when he talked about Jesus, I was touched. And I remember standing at the altar and I remember, or standing at my seat, just looking at my feet at the end. And, you know, he invited people to come forward. And I was looking at my feet thinking, what am I going to do about this Jesus? What am I going to do about what I just heard? And I just kind of felt this pull and this tug. And so I went up to the front and I gave my life to Jesus. I totally got saved. I totally got changed. Things began to shift on the inside of me. Within, within three months, I was deployed and I was a, a baby Christian on my own trying to figure things out, but I had been saved. I had been baptized. I've been filled with the Holy Spirit and I went out and my life began to change. I stopped cussing. I stopped drinking. I started changing and shifting as I read my Bible, as I prayed and met with other Christians. God began to change me, but I'll be honest with you. With you. I went to a Pentecostal church. I didn't know that there were differences in church. To me, church was just church. I didn't know there were Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or, or, or all the flavors. Like, I didn't know, you know, you don't, y'all know that like the kingdom of God still kind of operates like the, the nation of Israel. How, weren't there tribes in Israel? There was still only one Israel, right? But how many tribes were there? I, I feel like the New Testament church is like that. It's one church, but we got a lot, a lot of tribes, don't we? Some of them are, de- are, are, are Baptists, some of them are Methodists, some of them are Presbyterian, some of them are non-denominational, some of them are, are, are uh, Presbyterian, Charismatic, Pentecost, so I can go down the list. Free will, Holiness, Baptist, right? New Life Deliverance. I mean, we got all kinds of names, don't we? But the bottom line is, to Jesus, church is just church. Matter of fact, on this day in Pentecost, what we just read, the only church was the church. There were no other options. There were no other alternatives. I did not know that uh, uh, some churches, people wave flags. I did not know that some places, they shout. I did not know that in some places, they run. You ever been to a church where people run? I I did not know that sometimes 
people get what, what they call catch the spirit. And they start dancing and ho hollering and shouting and going off. I did not know that you could bring tambourines to church. Not here. You got, you got to be on the worship team. Amen. You can praise God with a loud voice and you want to use the tambourine. Amen. But do it on the worship team. Amen. Well, I saw a video where a lady was tearing up a tambourine. I'm telling you, you could do it. You can praise God with any, any instrument. But let's do it decently in, in order. Amen. But you know what I'm talking about. Pentecostal, we think all oh, speaking in tongues and all manifestations and all weirdness and all craziness and all. Ah, I didn't know anything about all that stuff. She said Pentecostal church, it was like a flavor of ice cream. Okay, it's still ice cream. Let's go. And God changed my life. God touched me. God experienced me. God, God came upon me. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And I want to talk to you about the meaning and importance of Pentecost for us today as followers. Now, I'm not banging on uh, Pentecostal churches or that denomination. I mean, because you guys know, sometimes that's associated with what? Long hemlines and no makeup. Right? Hair in a bun. Right? As you can tell, I'm a fan of makeup. I mean, I don't wear it, but I, I, my wife likes it. She looks good. Amen? Come on now, y'all religious on me or what? What happened? <laughs> right? These are not bad things. You don't have to wear a dress down your ankles to be holy. Those external signs don't reflect what's going on in your heart, right? Didn't Jesus say if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you're guilty of sin? You're guilty of adultery? You don't even have to physically commit adultery. You just have to deal with it on the inside. No, I'm looking at quiet now. Okay, we better move on. Today's Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost Sunday was, was critical in the life of the church, the birth of the church. It was foundational to the formation of the church. And it's no less foundational for us today. The power of God, the presence of God, the personal Holy Spirit, no less important for us today. A.W. Tozer said, if God were to take the Spirit, the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what we're doing in our churches would go right on and no one would know the difference. He says, I don't believe in a repetition of Pentecost but I do believe in a perpetuation of Pentecost. And there's a vast difference between the two. You know, the point that A.W. Tozer is making is that we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to make a difference in this world. We need the power of God. We need the presence of God. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us, to teach us, to anoint us, to equip us, to take from Jesus and give it to us, give, give that to us which is exactly what Jesus said he would do. We need the Holy Spirit to help us to pray, help us pray according to the will of God and the mind of God, which is what Romans 8 says. We need the Holy Spirit because he's a spirit of regeneration that takes the blood of Jesus and cleanses us from sin. We need the new life that the Holy Spirit brings. We need these things. But Pentecost wasn't just a one-time event that, that we have to pray for and believe for every year. Pentecost was meant to be something we walk in and we live in. The power that was poured on that day wasn't just cut off after that one shot. It was meant to be a continuously accessed thing for the church. It was meant to be something that we could walk in, that we can experience, that we can enjoy day in and day out as we follow the Lord. We need to receive the Holy Spirit if we're going to be his witnesses and testify the kingdom of God. We need to receive the Holy Spirit if we're going to have an actual legitimate impact. We know that by our strength or by our wisdom or by self-help uh, uh, plans and, and by different templates and different procedures, we know those things are not greatly effective at changing the human nature. Changing the human condition, are they? I mean, we have better qualities of life. We can live longer, give or take. Quality of life, give or take. We might have more stuff and we might have AC, but that doesn't mean we have better relationships. Doesn't mean we have better quality time. Just means we have more toys to waste. We need the Holy Spirit. The news headlines remind us we need the Holy Spirit. You go to work tomorrow, you know, well, not tomorrow because it's a holiday, but Tuesday. And you know you need the Holy Spirit. You jump on that Zoom call and you know you need the Holy Spirit. So much of the Christian experience in modern times is completely devoid of the presence of God in, in, in our lives. We're doing what we're doing, but we're doing it in our strength and our power. And, and listen, God created us in his image so we can do a lot of great things without him. And we'll see that later on. But there absolutely 
is no lasting change and lasting transformation and, and actual significant generational impact for good without the Holy Spirit. Flip back a page in Acts chapter 1, and we'll read verse 4 through 8. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of of the Father. Now, I just want to tell you, this is Jesus after he's resurrected. He's gathering with his disciples. This is the last conversations he's having with them. This is uh, end of Matthew, where he's given the Great Commission. This is the last conversations, and this is what he's saying. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. What was the promise of the Father? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see that, right? He says, wait for this. Okay, then what happens? Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The promise of the Father was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when the gift of the Holy Spirit came on our lives, we would receive power. They would receive power. Power for purpose. To carry out the mission of Jesus. To tell people of the good news of God's kingdom. To encourage people that there's hope. To do good works for the glory of God. You see that, right? You, this is a very clear thing. Jesus is prom saying the, the Father has promised you something. But don't go and do what I told you to do until you receive that promise. So wait, so wait. Now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit and our need for his presence in our lives, many people have opted out. Many people said, you know, I, I like Jesus, but that Holy Spirit, boy, I don't know. I mean, I like church. Church is a good thing. They do good things. They, they, they do good deeds, take care of the poor and they dig wells and they bring water and they, they, they make hospitals and they take care of people and they're, they're very kind. You know, they do a lot of good things. But that Holy Spirit, man, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I don't know about some of those things that, that I hear about them strange behaviors, those spirit-filled people. Like, they're a little bit different. And as I say that, y'all are picturing somebody in your mind. You know, it might be because of ignorance. You know, some denominations just flat out don't teach in the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because they can't control someone who's being led by the Spirit. What did Jesus say? He said, he said, he said look at the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. You can't control the wind. You just see the evidence of his presence. He says, so, is, so it is the one who is born again by the Spirit of God. You don't know how that happens. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know when it's happened. Amen. You can see the evidence of transformation when the Holy Spirit comes in a person's life and they're born again. The Bible says concerning spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the Bible says in somewhere around verse 30, 29, 30, 31, it says this, it says, don't, don't forbid the exercising of the gifts. It actually literally says, don't forget, forbid speaking in tongues. It says, but this, everything in church should be done decently and in order. But here's the thing. We're afraid of things getting out of order so we don't do certain things. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we, we can't control the Spirit of God. So what do we do? We, we, we don't want, we don't bring him up. So whole denominations don't want to bring him up because things might get messy. He might actually want to say something. He might actually want to take over. He might actually want to do something. So a lot of Christians aren't even aware that there is such a thing as the presence of God, being personal. They're not aware that you, that the children of God, Romans 8, 14, are led by the Spirit of God. They're not aware that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, that when we don't know how to pray, he helps us pray according to the mind of God. They're not aware that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive power to become. As many as received Jesus, he gave them the power to become children of God. The Holy Spirit is the agent of adoption who takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and places us into the kingdom of his dear son. 
Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have regeneration. The apostle John says this. He says, you don't need a lot of teachers. Why? Because you have the anointing, the Holy Spirit to teach you, to lead you into all truth. But so many of us live a life without the presence of God, without the gift of the Spirit. We, we like, I got Jesus and that's all right. And listen, there's no substitute for Jesus. But I want you to understand, just like Jesus said, I and the Father are one, so too is the Holy Spirit one with God the Father and God the Son. Sometimes we're like the disciples. In this passage right here, what were they focused on? Lord, when's your kingdom coming? Like, when are you going to remove the oppressors? When are you going to kick Rome out? When are you going to set up your kingdom? When are we going to rule with you? And some of us are so much more about the future, God. I can't wait for heaven. I can't wait to escape this place. I can't wait to get out of this job. I can't wait to get out of this drama. Just Jesus, save me. We're so focused on that that we miss what God wants to do right now and the kingdom that's present with us right here. I want to tell you today, there's a real need for the life and power of God in us. There's a real need for the church not to be religious and do what we can do in our own ability, in our own planning, in our own wisdom, and, 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 and lay it out according to our plan and according to what we like, but instead to receive the leading and the empowerment and the direction from the Holy Spirit so we can go forward in the calling of God. So we can speak to people words of life. When, when, when uh, Jesus was talking to his disciples and some people were going to leave after a, a speech that he gave, y'all remember that speech where Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me? Like, let's be honest. That's a bit strange. Like, for real, Jesus, are you a cannibal? Like, what's the deal? What are you talking about? And so people left because that was like horrendous. I mean, even today, we'd all be like, not today. Peter turned to his, or Jesus turned to his disciples and said, y'all want to leave too? And Peter's like, what? You have the words of life. See, Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. That's why every time Jesus spoke, something happened on people's hearts. The Bible says over and over again, you read the gospels and it says people were amazed. You know what they were? They were astonished out of their mind. They were beside themselves. When Jesus dropped truth bombs, they were like, <gasps> Can you believe what he said? I mean, if they had social media, media, he would have been blowing up the internet. Everything he said, they were like, this is radical. This is crazy. This is insane. They were like, oh my goodness, did you hear that? They were stunned. Why? Because when he spoke, he didn't speak like everybody else. He didn't just have words to say or fancy speeches or nice platitudes or cliches. He had power that reached into the soul. When he spoke, God spoke. We need that today. We don't need more experts and more wisdom and more pundits. We need a word from God. We need the Holy Spirit to speak the heart of God, the mind of God. Jesus said expressly in John 14, 15, and 16, when he's having his upper room conversation, before he's going to be betrayed, he said, I am going away and it's to your advantage I go away because if I don't go, the Spirit doesn't come. But he says when he comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's going to take the things that I have for you, and he's going to give them to you. He said, another comforter, one who's going to come alongside you, one who's going to strengthen you, one who's going to be with you, one who's going to speak to you, one who's going to guide you and direct you, he will be with you. And we need that. Because honestly, if we look around and we look on the posts and we follow church folk, how different is the average Christian than the character and the life and the, the people that we see described as followers of Jesus in the Bible? How different is the modern Christian from the actual Jesus that they're called after? Do the words that they speak sound like his words? Do the way they treat people look like the ways that he treated people? I'm saying all that to say this, that without the Holy Spirit, we can't do what Jesus did. But Jesus said this, you're my followers and you'll do the things that I've done, even greater things than I've done because I go to the Father. Do you know his re most repeated statement in that conversation is when I go to the Father and you have the Spirit, you'll ask whatever you want and the Father will give it to you. Without restriction, he said it at least five times in those three chapters. Ask what you want, I'll give it to you. Ask what you want in my name, the Father will take care of it. 
We need that power to bring change and transformation. The same power that came on the apostles, the disciples, all 120 of them that were sitting in that upper room over 2,000 years ago, that same power changed the world. We're still talking about it. We're still impacted by it. We are on the other side of the world. Why? Because there was real power to bring change, to bring transformation, to bring healing and hope that came on the day of Pentecost. I don't know about you, but I want some of that power in my life. And Jesus said, it's, it's, it's for you. Wait, because God has promised this to you. And this is why he commanded me. He said, look, y'all need this power. And let's, let's be honest. Most of us are not smart enough or talented enough or rich enough or skilled enough to make the kingdom of God go, mo- go forward, are we? Are we holy enough? Are we good enough? We need help, don't we? Because isn't that what he said we're supposed to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Tell them of all the things to baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do all things that I've commanded you. And yes, I'm with you even to the end of the age. As you go about and do what I told you to do, show people my love, teach people my ways, encourage people and give them hope to follow God and prepare for the kingdom of God, to get ready for my coming. And I mean, we struggle to get through cross town through traffic in holiness. Don't you think we need supernatural power? I mean, I, I appreciate some of y'all made it up this morning because I, I, I flipped my watch for five more minutes. I mean, some, di- some days it's just a struggle, ain't it? And if we leave it to ourselves and leave it to our flesh, it's not enough. We need power. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come and would give power to the disciples so they could be witnesses to him in the world. Crowds came. They wondered what was going on. The apostle Peter stood up and said, today is a special day. And he quoted to them. You can see this in Acts chapter two. I'm not going to read it, but he quoted to them the prophecy from the book of Joel and said, today is the day that God promised was going to come. Today is not an ordinary day. Today is a special day. Today is a moment that's going to change history. Today is the day where God said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh, that sons and daughters would prophesy, that young men would see visions, old men would dream dreams, and the kingdom of God would begin to advance. This is that day. This is what the prophet said. Today is a special day. So Pentecost itself is a witness to us and to the world that God is changing something, that God is doing something. And so we're going to look at three ways that Pentecost witnesses even to us today. And then one key thing that we can do to experience the power of Pentecost for ourselves. Amen. So if you're taking notes, point number one is Pentecost testifies of resurrection life. Pentecost testifies of resurrection life. Back in Acts chapter 2, towards the end, I'm going to read verse 36 through 41. The Bible says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made us, made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So context is, Peter and, and, the, and the other disciples get filled with the Holy Spirit. They come out, the crowds surround, and they're like, what's going on? And Peter says, today is the day of Pentecost. And he preaches to them about Jesus. And here's the end of his message right here. Now, when the people, the crowd heard this, they were cut to the heart. Why? Because his words weren't normal words. They were filled with the Spirit of God. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I'm telling you, when God speaks to you, there is something on the inside of you that wants to respond. Should I praise him? Should I repent? Should I turn? Should I follow? What should I do? When you hear God speak, something shifts on the inside. And they said, what should we do? And Peter says to them in verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And then listen to this, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise. What was the promise? Was the Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. And then with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And boy, if his generation was perverse, you know we're in it. Verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And about that day, 3,000 souls were added to them. Now, Pentecost, if you want to go back in the Old Testament to kind of get an idea about Pentecost, it's one of, one of uh, seven feasts 
It's one of three major feasts, though, where all the men of Israel had to come up to Jerusalem to worship at those particular feasts. It was called the Festival of Weeks or the Feast of Weeks. It was a celebration. How that came about was uh, Passover happened. Y'all know Passover, right? Where the, the lamb was, was slain, where they escaped from Egypt and God saw the blood. And when the angel of death saw the blood, he passed over judgment and Israel was delivered from, their, from bondage, right? Y'all remember that, right? So God tells back in Leviticus, he tells them when he's handing out the law, he says, count seven weeks and add a day. So seven Saturdays, seven Sabbaths, and add one day and you celebrate Pentecost, Shabbat. You celebrate this time. It's also called the first fruits harvest, where at that time of year, the people would take all of their first fruits from their products, from their produce, from their businesses, and they would take it to Jerusalem and they would offer it to the Lord. Now, I, just, just so you know how like challenging that would be, imagine you're living 35 miles away from Jerusalem and you've got a little farm. And you've managed to accumulate wealth, and that day would have been livestock, it would have been, it would have been barley, it would have been different types of agricultural things, and you have to take 80 cows because 80 cows represents the first fruits, the tithe of your of your your harvest. In other words, you had 800 ca- uh, cows born that year. So you take 80 of them. And let's say you had 15 acres of land and you harvested all the wheat of that land. So you got to take a tenth of that harvest and stack it up on those cows. And then you had to lead those cows and lead that, those, those things all the way into the city to offer it to God because you recognize that God was the one that blessed you, that God was the one, as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, that God is the one who gives you power to get wealth. So you come celebrating freedom from God or freedom from bondage. You come to worship the living God and you do it on Pentecost. You bring the first fruits after 50 days. Now, of course, seven weeks, seven sevens, plus one is how many days? 50. Again, that's why we call it Pentecost. But it was seven weeks. That's why it's called the Feast of Weeks. They brought the first fruits. The first fruits of what, though? Of their harvest, of what they had received. And, and, and Pentecost became another significant moment of worship. Now, bear with me. I'm just giving you a little bit of context because you got to get this because you got to see how cool God is and how cool uh, the Bible is and what God has done. Pentecost was also the time where they celebrated the giving of the law at Sinai. Y'all remember that? Moses goes up on the mountain, spends, how long did he spend in the presence of God? How long? 40 days, right? He comes down. Now, y'all, y'all might've seen the movie. He comes down glowing and got the tablet Tablets of stone in his hands, got the laws in his hands. And he comes down the first time, and what does he hear? Oh, he hears a big party. He's like, what's going on? He looks over the hill. What does he see? He sees X-rated stuff happening. He sees things happening. People got drunk, people got out of hand, people got out of control, and they're worshiping. What? This big golden calf, which I love Aaron's excuse because it's the most normal human excuse ever. When, when Y'all remember when, God, when, when he came up and, and, and Aaron, he's like, what are you doing? Because remember, Aaron made this cow and said, this is the God that delivered you, right? Moses comes up and like, Aaron, like, what's wrong with you, man? He said, man, listen, they gave me their gold. I put it in the fire and this popped out. This just happened. Their gold, fire? No, man, he hammered that thing. He made that thing. So what happens? Wrath comes out. 3,000 people die. The law was given. The the word of God was given. The, 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 The holy covenants between man and God. Israel, the chosen people, and God. The day that it was released, 3,000 die. But on the day of Pentecost... The Spirit of God is poured out and brings redemption in a powerful way and it testifies to life. Why do I say that? Well, think about this. Back then, when God said for the, when God established the festival of weeks, He said seven weeks, which would put you on a Saturday. So we're not going to do it on a Saturday. We're going to do it on a Sunday, add a day on a Sunday. Why? Because After Passover, the lamb was slain, but on Sunday, the first day of week, Jesus was resurrected. 
God was anticipating the resurrection. He could have left it at 49 days. He could have said, hey, we're going to celebrate it on Sabbath. But he didn't. He waited for the new day, the resurrection day, the day that Jesus exploded from the grave, the way that Jesus took death by the throat and said, I win. When the law was given, 3,000 died. But when Peter preached on that first day of Pentecost, how many were saved? 3,000. What did God do? Say, we're the law. What does the Bible say? Look at this, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter, a.k.a. the law does what? It kills, but the spirit does what? Gives life. What God was saying on Pentecost is that death is past, life has come. There's resurrection life. He didn't do it on any day. He didn't do it on Friday. He didn't do it on Saturday when they were mourning the death of Jesus. He did it on Sunday when we celebrate that Jesus is alive, amen, that death has been defeated, that our sins have been forgiven. And when he poured out his spirit, even though on the law 3,000 died, when he poured out his spirit, 3,000 were saved. And not only that, but the church, they say, was born on Pentecost Sunday. Do you know what Jesus said one day to his disciples? He said, look out to the fields. They're white with harvest. I'm sending you out as harvest workers. What was he talking about? He was talking about souls. He was talking about people. And on the very first day that the spirit was poured out on the Pentecost Sunday, on the festival of weeks, on the festival of harvest, bringing your first fruits, what happened? The first fruits of the church were added. He brought in the first gathering. That was the beginning of all that would be coming. Jesus came so we could have a superior, abundant life, he says. But it was when the spirit came that life came. Pentecost testifies a resurrection life. And then point number two, Pentecost testifies of unity and blessing. In verse one of Acts chapter two, the Bible says, when the day of fully of Pentecost had fully come, and that word fully come is pointing to, to the fact that it was 49 days plus one. That was actually the full 50 days. Let me, let me rewind and just say this. Jesus died, spent 40 days teaching his disciples, and then they spent 10 days in the upper room. 50 days. Exactly 50 days after he was crucified. But when the day of of Pentecost had fully come, they were what? With one accord, all of them in one place. You know that Jesus said one of the hallmarks of his followers would be their love for one another? There, there, there's a Greek word, this, this unity is pronounced homothumathon. That's how you pronounce it in the Greek. I'm not going to spell it for you because it's crazy. But it's the word that we have here, one accord. And what it means is that God's people were all with one heart and all with one mind. In the New Testament, it's used to stress there's an inner unity, an inner unanimity where people are in agreement. They're together in the community. They're all striving for the same thing. They're all leaning in, doing the same thing. They all have a desire and a will for the same thing. This being one accord, though, you see is repeated throughout the New Testament. In other words, us being together in unity is something that has to happen over and over and over and over again. It's not a constant thing. And while they were united in faith, what happened? They were filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues. Now, now again, I'm going to nerd out for you on you just a second. If you go back to Genesis chapter 11, and I encourage you to go back and read this to make sure I'm not making this up and make sure I'm not lying to you, amen? That's why we take notes in church. You can check the pastor. Read the Bible for yourself, amen? But go back, Genesis chapter 11. What, who knows what happens in Genesis chapter 11? What are they building? A Tower of Babel. So y'all remember what happens in the Tower of Babel. At that time, Genesis 11, 1 tells us that the whole world had what? One language. And what did they do? They decided to build a, a tower. Now, now, if you go back into it and really study into it, it's more like a ziggurat. Anybody remember from like old school history what a ziggurat is? It was like a temple to gods. And they were building this temple to gods. What they were trying to do was reach heaven without God. They were trying to, and what is, what is, I want you to see this because this is crazy. They wanted to reach the heavens, the realm of the gods without actually using the help of a God or engaging God and listen to what God says. This is crazy to me. Genesis eleven six. the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. So what did God do? He confused their language. 
right? Because he said, listen, these guys are so united. Their goal is so, so they're so focused on this goal. It ain't going to stop. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. Their unity is going to release a blessing that's going to cause a synergy that's going to take place. And there are things that are going to happen now. So what does God do? He confuses their language. That word Babel is actually a play on the word Babylon, but it's actually a play on the word that does sound like Babel, like nonsense, confusion. What do you do? He confused their language. Why? So they couldn't be in unity anymore. So they couldn't walk in the blessing anymore. Why? Because if they did, they would have built, they would have touched the heavens. They would have reached that goal. Many years later, God makes a promise to his people. And I'm only reading this because I want you to get it in context. Zephaniah 3.9 says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. Remember, God confused the language. But now he's saying, I'm going to restore a pure language. And you know that we need a pure language because I think every language on planet Earth has cuss words in it, has swear words in it, has dirty ideas in it. But God said, I'm going to release a pure language once again. I'm going to restore. I'm going to give back what once was. So why? That they may all call in the name of the Lord and to serve him with one accord. So on the day of Pentecost, God did exactly that. He restored the people a pure language, a holy language. What happened when they were filled with the Spirit? They spoke with tongues. Now that word tongues means languages. And we know that it was not just heavenly languages, though that's possible because uh, the Apostle Paul tells us so in 1 Corinthians 13. But, but it was languages that European Jews heard. All the nations were gathered there for that festival. All the dispersed Jews had come to Jerusalem for that festival. And when the disciples rolled out of there, speaking in languages, they understood. Why does that matter? What was the concern of the unity of Babel? Well, the people were successful at whatever they pursued. So they were confused in their language, so they wouldn't be blessed in their work. But when God's people came together in unity, he commanded blessing to flow into their lives, right? Isn't that what it says in Psalm 133? He commands the blessing where God's people are together in unity. And on Pentecost, in the midst of unity, God sent the very best blessing, his own self, his Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He restored the language. What did he do? He united the hearts. He reversed the curse that took place at Babel. So that why? So that the kingdom could be built this way forward. Remember, God had made a way. Jesus tore the veil. So there was, we have access to the throne of grace. And then finally, point number three, Pentecost testifies of power and changed lives. Psalm 62, 11 says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. And Jesus told the disciples that the coming of the Holy Spirit meant that they would receive power. And I'm gonna give you two little ways that, two ways that God gives us power. The first one is power to be witnesses. This is exactly what Jesus said. Micah 3, 8 says, but truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to do what? To declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. We receive power to declare the justice of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the, the good news of God. And the good news often requires us pointing out, hey, this is bad for you and will kill you, so turn away because here's the answer to what you're suffering. Amen? You won't change until you're confronted with the thing that you've, you're, you've grown comfortable with. Holy Spirit empowers us to do works of righteousness and to witness the love and grace of God. And then the second thing that power that God gives us uh, is, is power to do miracles. In Acts 10, 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? Because God was with him. God was with him. This power of the Spirit, the Greek is dynamis, dunamis. It's the same root where we get dynamite. It's the ability. It's, it's the enablement. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we have ability. We have enablement to actually do good God's way. To bring healing, to bring deliverance, to bring freedom, to do the things that Jesus said he was here to do. Pentecost testifies that it's not our power or our ability, but God's power and God's spirit that enables us to change lives and make a difference. Right? Y'all remember the familiar passage from Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, in, in our day and age, what is the ruling power? Would you say money might be the, the ruling power? If you think about it, everything is done because of why? 
because of my financial reasons. Jesus actually gave it a name and said it's the spirit of mammon. It's actually a spirit behind money. And money talks, don't it? Money controls. You, there are things you want to do, but you don't have the funding for it or the budget for it or the ability to do it. Why? Because you don't have the money. Right? I, I, I saw a video. Well, actually, uh, uh, I'll give a parallel to this. I was at, uh, we were taking uh, our, we were with our niece and nephews at a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese's. Y'all, y'all ever seen the little ticket things where you kind of go in, it's like a whirlwind and it blows all the tickets up? Well, I saw one of those, but I saw one where there's money in there. And a guy went in there, you know, and they have all the money on the floor and they wait for the tornado fan to go on and starts throwing money up there. And whatever money you can grab and keep, you know, you can take with you. And this guy was scrambling and grabbing and he was going after that. And he, he came out with a, a bundle of money. You know, he was after that. He was into that. I mean, how many of us wouldn't like the opportunity, you know, drop a million dollars in the floor and see what you get when you walk out? Anybody down for that? Well, let's go. I'm going to, yeah, I'll, I'll figure out a way. I got a strategy, right? How much more, if we're willing to do crazy things like that for some money, how much more should we pursue the power of God that actually brings change? Money's not lasting. You got to keep making money. And money is losing its value every day, man. That's not good. We need to pray for our country. But seriously, we pursue money. You work nine to five. You work 12 hours a day. You work 80 hours a week. Why? For money. Why? So you can do stuff. Things that are not lasting. Things that are not eternal. Things that ultimately do not change. Now they make you feel good in a moment. Right? It's nice to have a home. It's nice to have a car. It's nice to have a TV. Maybe you got a boat. Praise God. It's nice. But that's not eternal. It's not lasting. That's not the smile on your kid's face. That's not the presence of your spouse. You're spending 80 hours a week trying to get money to lose your family. To have no friends. Because, you know, your coworkers aren't really your friends most time because they're really just trying to angle to see how they can get over you on the job. If we're willing to do all that and go to that extreme for money so we have the ability, the power to do stuff, how much more should we press into God for true power to bring goodness, to bring glory, to bring change to the world, to leave a lasting legacy? We need resurrection life. We need unity. We need the blessing of God, don't we? I mean, we need real power, not words, not Religious platitudes, not, you know, when there's someone sick, we don't need to say, well, I'm sorry. We need to be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, amen? Amen. When someone's struggling with with depression or being oppressed, we need to have the authority in Jesus' name to see them set free. When someone's in need, we need not come up to them and be like warm and well-fed, but we need to be the blessed of the Lord, that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he has no sorrow to it. So we need to be able to have that money in our pockets. We can say, bless you in Jesus' name. We need what God has. But the question is, is that for us today? Can we get it today? How do we get it today if it's for us? So I want to finish up with this. Acts 2, 38 and 39, it says, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to this. This promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. Guess what? Today, we're afar off, aren't we? We weren't in that crowd. We weren't there that day. But that promise is still for you and it's still for me. Listen, and, and I want to just, I'm not going to, I'm just going to tell you this, but you can go through this. If you look in Acts chapter 10, this is about 10 years after the day of Pentecost was the first time that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. You remember Cornelius? He's a Gentile. God has a, there's a supernatural vision with the apostle Peter and sends him to this guy. And, and uh, while he's preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they got what the, the, the Jews got on the day of Pentecost. How do they know? Because it says, they saw, how they get this thing? They're speaking in tongues like we're speaking in tongues. Like, what is this? That's 10 years after. Fast forward about 25 years. Paul in Acts chapter 19 is walking up on some believers in Ephesus. He said, did y'all hear about the Holy Spirit? They're like, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. He said, well, what have you been baptized in? They said, well, in John's baptism. He's like, bro, you ain't even baptized in Jesus' name? Like John truly baptized for repentance of sin, but you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they get baptized. And then the Bible says that he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues and prophesied. 25 years after the day of Pentecost. 
I can go on. Acts chapter uh, uh, 8 with the apostle uh, or the uh, Philip the evangelist. He goes down. Samaria gets saved. And a couple of weeks later, the apostles hear that Samaria is full of Christians. And they say, hey, we need to send some apostles down so they get filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John went down to lay hands on the people because though they were saved, they had Jesus. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Not poured out. Acts chapter 4. This is the same time frame. This is right after God starts moving, the church starts growing, the persecution starts coming. They're praying again. Right after the apostles get thrown in jail, they come out, they get released, they're praying, and, and they say, God, look at their threats. Look at what they're doing. Give us boldness so we can preach. Give us boldness so we can live. Give us boldness. And what happens? The place where they were at was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit again. What I want you to know today is that promise is for us today. And it's a repeated promise. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, he says, don't, don't be drunk with wine where there's excess. Don't be overcome by the spirit of alcohol under the influence of the spirit of alcohol. He said, but instead be filled. And that Greek tense is be being filled with the Holy Spirit. God is faithful to give us the spirit. How do we get the spirit? It's real simple. Jesus told us, we ask. He said, our heavenly father knows how to give good gifts and will give the Holy Spirit to all who ask him. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive life, we receive blessing, and we receive supernatural power. And because we really receive the Spirit, we will actually have the ability, the capacity to live holy lives, to bring goodness to people's lives, to make a difference in our community that's more than just words, to walk in on a job and bring the presence of God and the peace of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God. We'll have that. Why? Because we received what they received on the day of Pentecost. Let's pray. Now, when we pray, I just want to ask you real simply to ask God, what is he saying to you? And then I want to challenge you to ask God for the Holy Spirit. I believe that God wants to give us all a fresh gift, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit and power. But God's not going to force it on us. But I believe that if we ask him, he'll do exactly what he said and give, him, give us the Holy Spirit. So Father, as we are pra praying now in your presence, as we uh, see that Pentecost was more than just a moment, it's a day to memorialize for sure, because Pentecost testifies of resurrection life. Pentecost testifies of unity and blessing. It tells us of the power of God that's real. It's not a figment of our imagination. It's not some hopeful idea. It's not weird and it's not strange, but it's overwhelming and powerful. And Lord, you said, most crucially, this was not an option for them to wait. It was a command for them to wait because they needed desperately the Holy Spirit. Today, God, here we are. And I don't know the condition of everyone's hearts. I don't know the condition of their lives. But I know this, we all need the Holy Spirit, the gift that you promised. And so today, Father, I ask you to stir up our faith so that we might receive, we might ask, we might believe, we might trust that what you give us is exactly what you promised. And as a result, when we walk in new power, new life, new victory, we'll have power to be witnesses, to tell others, to do right, to make a difference. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.